J.J. McCarthy will start for the Minnesota Vikings eventually. The question is how long it'll take. Welcome to Lockdown Vikings Podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much to those of you who listen to Locked On Vikings each and every day. My hashtag everydayers, I've been hearing about J.J. McCarthy for far too long already, and you're going to hear about him more. <laughs> thank you to everybody here who is new, who's deciding to show up, try this out because it's the draft. Love you all very much. You can, of course, find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it's a podcast listening app like Sirius XM. We're partnered with them. You can go find uh, live broadcasts of any Minnesota sports game on the Sirius XM app. Just search out like Timberwolves or whatever. Uh, 3-0 and now over the Suns for them, by the way. You can also find this show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. If you have a competitive side, you got to check out Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. So, uh, today I promised you some film. I promised you some, so, I mean, I can't do like literal film on the, it's a podcast, uh, but most of the people who listen are audio listeners, but uh, I promised you some analysis that wasn't just about like trade value. So, we had the trade value conversation yesterday. Um, today, it was day two of the draft. Vikings, as expected, didn't make any picks. So we don't have anybody new to talk about. Um, so let's dive a little deeper into the quarterback that the Vikings got. So I want to talk a little J.J. McCarthy. I want to talk a little bit of Dallas Turner. And then if we have time at the end, I can shout out a few names that I'm watching as we start day three, which might even have already happened by the time you listen to this. Or maybe you're listening to this during day three because the TV broadcast during day three, I'm going to be honest, pretty boring. Um, so the operative question here with JJ McCarthy is whether or not he's going to start right away, right? Can he, can he be your day one guy? Is he our guy or are we going to have to watch some Sam Darnold? And if, if you came here expecting a definitive answer to this question, you're probably new here. Cause I don't really, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I know better than that. <laughs> uh, it's, this is not a question that gets a definitive answer. You don't, you, they, they are not going to, Kevin O'Connell even said, like, we aren't going to have milestones where, you know, benchmarks where we say, okay, by here we want your development to, you know, happen this way. By here we want your development to happen this way. The way that Kevin O'Connell approaches this, it's the way he's done in the last two years. He's, he uh, talked about that. He's going to probably do it the same way. His spring is not an, is not an evaluative time. Nobody's in a position battle in spring. That's the way he tells his coaches. That's the way he tells everybody. Nobody is is should feel like they're competing. That's I think that's easier said than done, right? If you're a position coach, you're watching guys, you're 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 making judgments in your head no matter what, right? But uh, it should be a time for 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 no pressure. We're learning new uh, new, new scheme stuff, you know, rookies are getting acclimated to the playbook. We're fixing mechanic things that we need to fix. Like we're doing whatever we need to do. That's what spring is for. And then once you get into actual camp, then we start installing, then we get into competitive periods. Then we get into, you know, position battles, rotating snaps, who's the starter, that kind of stuff. Um, so by the end of spring, we won't have even thought about this. The Vikings will, will not have even thought about this. Uh, by the end of training camp, they'll have, of course, a definitive choice on who's going to start week one. And then I think it's a week to week proposition. I know that's like a boring answer is, is we'll see like, that's of course, that's the most boring answer. That's not going to be very satisfying, but I don't feel like any saying anything else would be true. So let's instead reframe this and say, what has to happen for JJ McCarthy to start? And then we can kind of look for that. So that's going to sort of by its nature negatively tint this because I'm basically going to have to start just listing the flaws and say, well, if this, that, and that gets fixed, then he's there. And that means we're only going to talk about negatives, but make no mistake. Uh, I like this. I'm in let's go. We're, we're good for JJ McCarthy. I like JJ McCarthy. I I'll probably do a show, um, next week about like the supporting cast thing which I think is a really, really bad talker and like busting myths, I think, like some J.J. McCarthy myth busting. Um, but for now, I want to focus on what I actually do think real flaws are and 
how we can expect those things to develop so we can maybe try to get a better sense for for when he's going to start. Uh, and the first one of those is, I guess the first two are like related. So let's start with the zippy pass thing. Um, so he just, he's not a touch thrower. He doesn't, he doesn't have that, that feathery Larry touch thing. Um, that's one of the things that I harped on a lot going into the draft was like, okay, this guy doesn't have like a, like a air under it ball, which means you kind of always have to have a little air under it for a deep ball. And that means that you sort of lose it on the deep ball. He just doesn't have that. Um, Kurt Warner in a video about it, I it put it really well. And he was, you know, when you, when everything is a hundred miles per hour all the time, he's every single pass is always like a, like a whip. Uh, you have, have to be perfect accuracy wise, because the harder you throw it, the more power you try to put into it, the more any tiny little hitch in your giddy up gets exacerbated. Uh, and you're going to start spraying if you're just a little bit off. Whereas if you just you put you just relax a little bit, put a little air under them, they can be a little bit more forgiving. Um, so when you see misses, like just straight up misses, a lot of times he's it's it's either that he's winging it or that he's trying to throw with touch and he can't. So that's there's two things there. There's you know too many of these are bullet passes. And you don't have a deep ball. And I think those things are very related. Um, so I think that is the main thing outside of your classic rookie stuff. Got to learn the playbook. Got to learn the speed of the game. Um, that is the main thing that would I, keep J.J. McCarthy off the field. And I don't even know if you need to keep him off the field for that. Because that's not like when it comes to what a what what would like ruin a player's development, right? Missing passes, unless there's like this like major confidence issue that you need to worry about. But I don't think that there is one with JJ McCarthy. Um, unless it's like a confidence issue, you don't like you can miss and learn from it, right? Like you can work that out in live action, and it'll cost you production it'll cost you games but hey we're you know this is rookie developmental year you can kind of say we're okay with that right we kept our 2025 first you know we can uh look forward to that draft pick you could do all that coping right to me the danger of putting a guy in too early is if there is a bad habit that you aren't able to fix because you're too worried about just like kind of staying afloat down to down and game to game learning game plans dealing with pressure all that stuff so if there's like a problem with with pressure response, which for J.J. McCarthy, to me, that might be my favorite thing about him is his pressure response. Uh, so putting that into live action, I'm perfectly comfortable with. But let's say that O'Connell sees that, you know, kind of zippy pass thing, that no touch thing. You know, we're not putting you in until you have a touch pass, right? We're not we're going to put you in until until you can do go balls. And there is definitely uh, an argument that just is that just doesn't give us a better chance to win this game that we're about to play. And ultimately, in the NFL, the not for long league, you only get a few dozen games in your career before you're either a, a, a bona fide winner or you're fired. So you don't really have the time to like toss a whole bunch of them in the trash. Um, go win the game in front of you, and that might mean Sam Darnold for a while until he can get that touch pass thing. So one thing to look for, I guess, in camp or in, even in OTAs, look for those nice layery go. You see like a, a highlight of like a beautiful, you know, fluttery go ball dropping right in the bucket for someone, for Justin Jefferson, you know, you see that in OTAs, we're flying. That eh, probably won't be Justin Jefferson because OTAs are voluntary, but I guess that's a thing to look for. Uh, elsewhere in the kind of flaws category for JJ McCarthy, there's definitely a couple like just one too many turndowns. And I've I've now watched seven, eight games of, of his 2023 season. So I'm getting down to the end of that. Uh it's and I've I haven't seen a ton of mysterious turndowns, but I've seen enough to be concerned. And there might be a red zone concern here, which is really hard to uncover. And it gets into the supporting cast thing, which I don't have time to really get break down in a lot of nuance, but they didn't pass a lot on the goal line, which, I mean, you've got this Blake Corum run game. Yeah, just run everybody over, which is basically what they did, and they would score every time. Um, but when they did throw in the red zone, you, you would see some of his worst plays. There's a really nasty interception against Maryland. There's, I think, two bad, really, really bad interceptions against Bowling Green. 
And then maybe after that, they get a little discouraged and they see, well, we can just bowl everybody over if we, if we run inside zone anyway. So let's just do that and dare someone to stop us and nobody could. And they scored a bunch of points. <laughs> but that then lowers the sample that we get when we're trying to evaluate J.J. McCarthy in the red zone. Things compress interestingly in the red zone. Uh, and, and it does change the way that you have to read things out. It, it makes everything have to be a little bit faster. Um, so th- that is also something you may want to or it's just red zone, like the difference in, in red zone stuff, the idea of, you know, you're, you're safe if you're high in the red zone. If you're throwing the ball high, you're throwing the ball safe. Um, th- principles like that that don't necessarily compute between the, tw- you know, between the 20s, you miss high, you're throwing it right into the lap of a safety, right? Like that's, it's a different mentality. Um, so that is perhaps something, I'm not really locking that in yet, but it's, I don't know, something I noticed in the last... 24 hours watching extra games of JJ McCarthy now that I know he's the Vikings guy. Um, but I guess I'll leave it here and then we'll move on to Dallas Turner. Uh, I implore you, please God be patient. This is not the time to rush him in. This is not the time to tap your foot and, and, and point at your watch and say, when's this guy going to get in? It's week five. This could take all year. It really could. And, and that would be fine. That if that's what he needs, um, this is, a time where we aren't going to get a good answer. They're going to deflect the question every single week. You're going to get annoyed with it. Be ready for that. That's how this goes. You deflect the question every single week. Delhi's in. Even if Sam Darnold throws three interceptions, JJ McCarthy isn't ready. It doesn't mean put him in. You put him in when he gives you the best chance to win the game. And that has a lot more to do with what's going on behind the scenes of JJ McCarthy that we won't get to see. And we just have to take it on faith. So, Put, put your patience hat on, hats on. If there's one thing for you to ever be patient about, it is this. You know I'm a big fan of patience here on Locked on Vikings. Also a big fan of Dallas Turner. Let's talk about him next. Today's episode of Locked on Vikings is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. You still have one more Wolves-Suns game you get to gramble on before I guess they're just win by 30 and move on. I guess that's what's happening in this series. <laughs> Or you can bet on any other NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs, baseball's going on, all kinds of great stuff, all at FanDuel. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. You can bet on anything from three-point spreads, uh, money lines, over-unders on total on point totals and stuff, you know, slap shot goals, that kind of stuff. So what are you waiting for? Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and you can make your first bet an automatic $150 win. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the best place to find last minute tickets to anything. If you're trying to get to a Wolves game last minute, you can find those tickets on Game Time. You can find, of course, more than just sports games, concerts, comedy, theater, and you can save up to 60% off buying last minute because by the time the, the event is like open, people are just trying to get rid of their tickets and Game Time can manipulate that get and pass the savings on to you. You can even get tickets up to an hour into the event. Uh, and see, you know, take your chances with that if you're really spontaneous or just a bad planner like me. You get all in pricing. That means that if you have that feature on, you will see like the total checkout price. No hidden fees, no nonsense. They're not trying to pull one over on you. And you can see your seat view as well. So you can actually make sure that you're not like stuck behind a pillar or something or you're not uh, or that you're just generally satisfied with the view. So go to the Game Time app or gametime.co.co. Create an account and use code Lockdown NFL for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N F L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Moving on to Dallas Turner here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. Uh, if you are enjoying this, hey, we got all kinds of live stuff going on. You can go check out live uh, coverage of day one if you want to go just like relive the moment where Michael Penix went to the Falcons. You can find uh, the Minnesota football party, Locked On Minnesota Sports. Just go to the live tab. You can watch that on demand. You can, uh, of course, find the 24-7 live stream on Locked On Minnesota Sports and a national one encompassing all sports at Locked On Sports Today. All kinds of sweet stuff going on. The Locked On Podcast Network. Okay, so a, a little bit more about Dallas Turner. Um, I, I sort of dove back in. I was told I got to watch the Georgia game, got to watch the conference championship. Um, 
and you know, I, you, you see those like speed to power long arm sacks. I re- that game is fun. If you get a chance, I mean, shoot, I'll send you the tape if you want it. Just email me at lockdownvikingspodcast at gmail.com. But um, it, that game between him and that tackle, I forget his name, number 71, left tackle on Georgia, who is not, who isn't declared this year, but he's supposed to be one of the better guys next year. Really fun matchup. And they got some licks on each other, uh, which is always really fun to see when both guys are able to sort of expose each other's weaknesses, but also highlight each other's strengths with their own weaknesses. Like it's really cool. Uh, some of the most fun tape to watch is those kind of like, just like knock them down, drag it out bar fights. Um, so Dallas Turner approached that game in particular, really interested in speed to power. Speed to power is a, a lovely way to, uh, to punish tackles who are, are worried about your speed, right? Um, it's a great, if you, if you get an edge rusher, who's got just get off, right. Who's just got like speed and, and you know what? Hey, day three's coming up. They might not be done at edge rusher. They might get another one, add some competition. And, and usually you talk about day three guys. You're starting to just get to dudes that maybe aren't that good, but are just jocks. Um, this was the Andre Patterson thing when he would get one of these like speedy edges. This was like the, this, Famously, Daniel Hunter, this is how he started with Daniel Hunter, was speed to power. Um, If you can get off the ball quickly, you can make that tackle afraid of your speed. And that means if you show that, if if you threaten that speed, they will set vertically. And depending on how they're coached, that either means they're going to set, you know, just go straight back, shoulders square. That's the way I think is best because I learned a lot from DVDs of Jim McNally, <laughs> who's who teaches that, uh, and all of his disciples that are now scattered throughout the league. Um, or like a true vertical pass set where like the the shoulders turn. Either way, they are they're angling for depth over width, right? They're angling and and they're angling for depth over like a solid base of power. And if you can get them to do that, and then transition it into power and bull rush you can get them on a bad base and then you're bull rushing against a bad base. You're going to be able to walk them right in. And, and Dallas Turner, instead of just bull rushing, you know, normal two hands on him and get your leverage and go, he bull rushes with a long arm, um, get one arm kind of right under the, right into the breastplate and then use like the reach advantage that gives you. Cause one arm is longer than two. Um, that was his go-to move here. He gave that tackle hell with these speed to powers. It was super, super awesome to watch. But I think the setup to that was even cooler. Like the thing that made that tackle, cause he would, you know, really pass set vertically and he would get his shoulders turned and he would, you know, you, you would end up getting him like weight on his heels. Um, but what led to that sort of respect was like, okay, so this tackle did not respect Dallas Turner going into this game. Uh, he was trying to like, wide set him jump set him uh there, i mean there's all kinds of different names for stuff don't worry about to, about it too much uh but essentially look if you're a tackle you're a big big bad monster boy and you don't respect the guy across from you he's ah, i can beat this guy up right you're gonna jump set him this is christian derisaw christian derisaw has no respect for anybody across from him because he jumps set. he loves to jump set guys because he knows that if i can get my my, my mitts on him if i can get my big old bear paws on him um, and close down the space that he's using to try to set up like pass rush moves. Uh, he can't punish me because I'm bigger and stronger than him. That's the Christian Derrissaw mentality. And this tackle was using that same mentality. And that mentality is great as long as you're right about that. <laughs> Cause punishing a jump set, like there's a lot of ways to get punished for that. If you aren't correct and you don't win that fight. And I would say this tackle was right about half the time against Dallas Turner. He's a good player. Dallas Turner's a good player. They were they were they were really matched up. Uh, and when you see these like wide sets, essentially that that is really saying you know I, I think I can basically I can beat you in an arm wrestle. You know I I think I can just get up and beat you, and I don't need to have like this kick slide and you know, these, you know, hands up and all these little techniques that you use to like win leverage and win these reps. I don't need any of that. I'm just going to come right up at you and win. Um, and when he would get his mitts on Dallas Turner, you would see what we talked about 
uh, yesterday and what I talked about in the Patreon video, which you can find at patreon.com slash NFL. I unlocked it so everybody can watch it now. Uh, it's the only D-line one everyone can watch. Everything else you got to join for for D-line and quarterbacks. It's all free. So you can watch my J.J. McCarthy one there too or other QBs, I guess, if you want. Um, but what I talked about in that and yesterday was that Dallas Turner is a leverage winner. Um, really good at setting leverage, setting up his leverage. That's like the way that he wins these bull rushes is by keeping himself low, by having a really good control over angle of power, really good balance. It's not a technique thing. I think it's an athleticism thing. Um, it's 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 like there's just it's a natural thing. It's I don't know. There's a naturalness to it that's not. It doesn't look taught. It just looks like comfortably known. Uh, and when you're that kind of leverage winner, he's a smaller player with good athleticism, right? Good explosion and stuff like that. But ultimately, sometimes the beef runs out on you. And so he could kind of get smoked. But every time, like th this guy started jump setting him too much and he would just rip around the edge of him and get around. And I think he got at least one sack that way. Uh, and so then he starts pass setting and then you can, he starts trying to, you know, set a little more conservatively and then you punish that with speed to power. And so you could kind of see, he basically, he went up against this guy almost exclusively the whole game and, and you could see the game as the game developed, you could see Dallas Turner kind of saying, oh, you changed your strat. Now I'm going to change mine and I'm going to get up into you. It's this really cool, like cat and mouse game in the chess game of it. It's really fun to watch O-line D-line matchups like that. When guys, I loved this in the Zimmer, the Zimmer defense. It's really fun to watch guys like that. Um, that said, part of Dallas Turner is versatility. He did line up all over the field in other games. I think that was just like a game plan for Georgia. Uh, and they, and and when he gets here, he's going to move all around the formation. This is Flores, right? Flores is not just going to, you know, plop him down at five tech with your hand in the dirt all day and do that. That's not the way that Flores rolls. He's going to drop into coverage. He's got a lot of versatility and all that stuff. This is also part of his evaluation. But that game, I, I kind of just talked about only that game, but that game just like really was fun to watch. The, the idea of like taking an L and then what do you change about your game to make sure that you punish what he did to give you that L. And it, there was a much more long-term outlook to it and over the course of that whole game. And I think he ended up notching two or three sacks and a bunch of pressures, and he had a great game. Um, against a player that, like, it's definitely is good. That, like, put up a great fight, as I don't think has anything to hang his hat about. Uh, so, okay, enough about those guys for now, at least. Uh, I, I want to do another Patreon, I think, on both of them. We'll try. But for now, let's move on to looking forward to day three. As you're listening to this, there are a few players on the board. I'm it's Saturday or it's Friday night, early Saturday morning. Let's be honest. Uh, and I am looking at the board here and I'll shout out some names I think are interesting. That'll be next. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go, a, a twist and expanded version, I guess I will say, of the classic family board game that will tear your family apart look if you we all do it get competitive with uh monopoly and this really gives you the tools to indulge the most villainous part of yourself which we're all interested in doing of course you can uh take a wrecking ball to your friends and loved ones properties you can of course charge them rent and all the the normal stuff you can just rob them you can heist their vaults take all their money uh, and then taunt them with uh, special emojis made specifically for that because Monopoly Go knows, knows how their bread is buttered, I think. They know the actual draw of Monopoly is destroying your loved ones, and they're willing to lean into that. Plus, they've got all kinds of other little like mini games and stuff like a robot pachinko machine and um, other timed events, tournaments. There's all kinds of like expansions on the classic idea of Monopoly. So go check out Monopoly Go. And uh, download it now, free on the Google Play or App Store. All right, moving on here with the Locked On Vikings podcast. So day three is about to start. The Vikings have less capital than they walked into the weekend with, right? They did some trading up, but they still have pick 108. Uh, and then they have two six and two sevens. So they'll have five right now. Uh, one of those could end up being a fifth. I could on very much see a world where they trade down from 108. So that's like that's the eighth pick of the day. So you're going to kind of have to be tuned in right away, 11 o'clock central. Uh, but then it, it, they they might trade down and try to recoup some of the um, some of the draft picks that they used to trade up. 
Uh, so we'll see kind of what goes down here. But in terms of the D-line world, where I don't think the Vikings should be done at D-line for sure, just for Dallas Turner. I get, get somebody on the interior, and if they got another edge, I certainly wouldn't scoff at it. Uh, there are a couple of names that are really exciting to me that are available. Um, everybody on their like best available players remaining has Brandon Dorless out of Oregon, who I hadn't watched. I, I flip, flipped him on a little bit, um, just before recording this, just to see I, I, he can play. I like him. Uh, I definitely like him in the fourth round. I'd be very happy with that. He plays like a three tech kind of position. Um, or, you know, like a four tech kind of thing, the the Dean Lowry position. Uh, you can also see Makai Wingo out of LSU and Jordan Jefferson out of LSU, both the LSU guys. I like them a lot. Makai Wingo is more that like pass rushing three tech type and Jordan Jefferson is, is your big, you know, hulky nose. I would take Jordan Jefferson in the fourth. I like him a lot. That is way higher than consensus. So, <laughs> you know, take that as you will. Um, but uh, Hey, I'm sticking to my convictions. All right. Everybody else can bite sand. Uh, <laughs> those are a couple of deals in terms of the edge world. There's guys like Austin Booker are left. He's a very, like a, just a, a only dip and rip guy. Uh, and I don't really love him. He's very Andre Carter coded and not in a good way. It's very like, if he can't get around you, he can't get past you, you know? So if you've got any, um, if, if you've got a good pass set, like you've got all the answers to what he does. And I, I don't really think that there's a future for edges like that in the league, but I could be wrong. Right. Um, there's also Xavier Thomas, who I like a lot. Xavier Thomas is a Clemson guy's 25, I think. And that's why he's available here. You know, there is absolutely the concern of this dude was just six years older than his competition was in college forever. Um, but you can see that experience. Uh, he's a very no nonsense pass rusher and that can bite people sometimes like so is Layatu Latu and that actually some of his worst reps come when he's just like trying to kind of get right down to brass tacks and not doing enough to set himself up um but Xavier Thomas it's not that it's not he's not just rushing his process he just he's got one jab step and that's what's supposed to bring you inside and then he's gonna you know try to swim over the outside or whatever the the setup and the knockdown is um and I, it's, it's very efficient. Maybe that's a, a way to do it. There's no wasted motion in his stuff. And, uh, he's had some really great moments at Clemson. I, I uh, like him a lot in day three. And that's where you don't really have to worry, be worried about if he's old. Cause like if you, especially if you, if you get to the point where you're like, you're talking second contract for Xavier Thomas, he's already a phenomenal fourth round pick. Um, and then, you know, you're going, yeah, but he's 29, blah, blah, blah. Like whatever. We're, if we're even talking about it, this dude was a slam dunk. Uh, like he's already much better picked than DJ Wanham was right. If you're giving him a second contract or even, even like thinking about it. Um, if you want to look outside of the defensive line though, there's, so I, I guess the biggest name on everybody's board that's still available is Troy Franklin wide receiver and, and some kind of wide receiver coming out of day three feels like a pretty good bet. Having it be the, the, the fourth round guy, uh, you kind of need to be in love with someone. And hey, a lot of people are in love with Troy Franklin. I am not. <laughs> Maybe one of my strongest uh, hate campaigns this year was against Troy Franklin. And it, it came purely from like, don't take me too seriously. here. It came purely from watching Bo Nix tape and therefore watching, you know, the whole Oregon offense and kind of just getting just a lot of things were wrong drops or other general like failures to help his quarterback out. Like, I don't think that he did Bo Nix too many favors and just kind of seeing that when the, when that passing offense needed a play, it kind of never went to him. You know, the, the most impactful feeling moments from those games that I watched were not Troy Frank, Troy Franklin plays. Um, I don't know. Maybe I just watched the wrong games or something like that, but I'm not a big fan of his, uh, there's also, I, I, the Vikings don't need to tackle at all, but I really like, uh, Christian Jones out of Texas and in terms of tackles, uh, mostly from the, uh, from the games I watched of edges that played him, including, uh, Dallas Turner. He had a great game against Dallas Turner. So that would be a, a pretty cool pick for someone, but probably not the Vikings. If we're going to be honest, look, they can get, there's like tight ends out there. I, I think uh, a fourth round tight end is actually not a bad idea for the Vikings, considering that you're probably looking at losing some, some time of TJ Hawkinson early in the season. So bolstering that depth so that you can, you know, better withstand that blow. Pretty helpful. 
uh, but not a necessity by any stretch of the imagination. And at this point, you're thinking more about depth. You're not going to expect to get like starters at this point. You get a starter today. You get a starter on Saturday. You're feeling really, really, really good. So... Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I, so I'm going to be, on, there's going to be a bunch of YouTube shorts. So if you're watching YouTube, you'll, you'll just, I don't know, turn on the notification bell for Lockdown Vikings. You'll see every pick the Vikings make. Uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of content all over the place about all of these guys. And then of course there will be another show tomorrow talking about it. We'll do a show, I, maybe a show on Monday, uh, if there's enough to talk about. I mean, we'll do, do like the undrafted free agents, right? So we'll, we'll go into at least that much and then um, probably take a couple of days off. But, you know, if you're uh, go to work, maybe you're listening to this Monday morning because you didn't listen all weekend. So hi, everybody. Hope you enjoy the draft. <laughs> and then uh, we'll hopefully get some guests and stuff in here, too. And then for the month of May, this is actually going to be a three day week show instead of a five day week show, mostly because I'm going to be out of town for a lot of May. So we're going to kind of slow things down, chill them out a little bit. So I will see you all. Uh, I'll see you all tomorrow, though. And we'll deal with all that when we deal with that, okay? Love you. Have a good one. And as always, skull.